The next speaker is Luis Geraldo Gonzalez Ricardo, from also from the University Carlos III. Go ahead, without further ado. Well, good morning in social and online uh, listeners. My talk is on the ratios and total of generalized multilevel Hermita Pade polynomials. And Guillermo gave me a nice introduction to my subject. This is a joint work with him and Sergio Medina, who is in the public too. Well, the, my outline is simple. I will give a little introduction or a quick introduction because Guillermo said an uh, important part of what I bring here in the introduction and afterwards we'll be dealing with it, our main developments. So we have a class of measures, as Guillermo said before, positive border measure with support in the three outline and infinitely many points. As well, the interval delta is the convex hull of the support of these measures, and we will ask that the moments are finite too, in order that to have orthogonal polynomials very well defined. Again, we have the Cauchy transform of the measure S, and we associate to this Cauchy transform its Laurent expansion at infinity. And here we have the Hitchin system of measures. So we already see this before. If we have two intervals in the real line with empty intersection and given two measures, one in each interval, we define a third measure, a product of measures in this way, we perturb the first measure with the Cauchy transform of the second measure. If we repeat this process, in from now on, we I will expose the, the main results with three measures in three intervals, but these results can be extended with a little more of effort to system of M measures with not too much problems. So if we have three intervals and three measures, three intervals with empty intersection, we said that this negation system is formed by these three measures, S11, S12, S13. If they are constructed in this way, we have we have here. Of course, if we take the, the Cauchy transform of each one of these measures, we have the Nikishin system of functions. So again, if we have a multi-index with not all uh, the components equals to zero, and we take the norm of the multi-index as the sum of the three components, we have the definition of the multi-level the polynomials introduced by Lisso, generalizing this idea with uh, given by Guillermo Sergio and Jacek before, and which is our main resort. First of all, we need to introduce a new multi-index, NL, that is constructed in the following way. We add one to the Lth component of this multi-index in order to have a sequence of order in some way polynomials, and notice that. With this, we have a theorem uh, with the ratio asymptotic of these Hermite Pade polynomials. If we have this negation system with the requirement we said before, we add the condition that the Radonic Picolin derivative of the sigma k measure is different from zero almost everywhere in this interval. And we ask the same condition on the sequence of multi index. Then, for the different case, for the different polynomials, we have this ratio asymptotic behavior. The quotient of the two consecutive polynomials defined in this way with this uh, multi index ML has limits where C L is a, a very precise branch of a conformal map that we will describe a little bit before. In this, some ways, this theorem resembles the one by Rachmanov on classical orthogonal, on orthogonal polynomials in one interval. So again, we set eta and j as the sum from n1 up to nj of the coefficients of the multi-index, the component of the multi-index. And here I'm going to expose some properties of, the, of these polynomials that are relevant for the next developments. Some uh, all of these properties were given before by Guillermo and 
file is of two. If we have the second of multi index, the multi index are normal, so the polynomials are of a side, has a side degree, a side degrees. The first form has no zero outside the interval delta one in the complex plane. And for each j, each form has exactly eta and j zeros. As well, of the, all these zeros are simple and are in the interior of the interval delta j. So Guillermo stated that in proof that there are some polynomials W that satisfying some properties. Well, these polynomials are uh, relabeled with Q and satisfy the following properties. These polynomials has zeros in exactly where the linear form NJ has uh, sign changes. For what we have proven before, the degree of this polynomial are exactly eta and j for each j. The ratio of this polynomial of this of the linear form and the polynomial is holomorphic outside delta j one j plus one and are big O of one over z to the power of eta and j plus one. Uh, um, moreover, the polynomial QN3 is exactly the last polynomial AN3. And this property, exactly this property, it will be very helpful to obtain our main result. As well, we have an integral representation for the ratio of the linear form A and J and the polynomial Q and J given in this form, where the, we have here a varying part of the, of a measure, and then we are going to define the polynomial Q and zero as one, in order that this form takes this formula has sense for all indices J. And the most important part, uh, Guillermo uh, proved this before, is that the linear form A and J plus one satisfy some orthogonality relationships with a varying measure with respect to the exactly measured sigma j plus one over the polynomial q and j. And these orthogonalities are full. We have full orthogonality relationships. Now, if we set this function h and j equals us the, the multiplication of q and j plus one to the linear form a and j and divide by the polynomial q and j. And by convenience, we have q and c and q and four. So the two extremal polynomials in this equal one. And the function h and three by consequence is the third power of minus one. Therefore, the previous orthogonality relationships are transformed in this new way, such that here we have the orthogonality with respect of the polynomial q and j plus one with respect to a varying measure, where in the denominator of this measure there are over two polynomials. Sorry. As well, we have an integral representation for the form a n and j. So these relationships means that the polynomial q and one is orthogonal with respect to the measure sigma one and has a varying part given by h and one and q and two. The q and two then have h and two, the second measure and two polynomials, q and one and q and three. And for the final polynomial, q and three, we have minus one to the, to the third power, the third measure and the polynomial q and two. Notice that here in the first and, and third, Orthogonality relation we have also a one given by qn zero and qn four. And again, what is important here also is that the first polynomial has to be n one and we have n minus one, n one minus one orthogonalities. Here we add n two orthogonalities and finally in the last polynomial we have the norm of n minus one orthogonality conditions. So a very important uh, result, if we can, we were able to extend 
the inter pro interlacing property of the zeros of these new forms defining as list of and uh, yeah, define. So if we have this Nikitian system with three measures for each multi-index with a given conditions for each j in the zeros of two consecutive form in the interval delta j interlace. So this is a very important property because this will, will allow us to prove that the fractions of two consecutive polynomials q and j is a normal family. And here I'm going to sketch the proof. So let's fix a multi-index n and one j. We have two real numbers, not all equal to, not the two equal to zero, and we construct this new linear form d and j as a linear combination of a and j i a, a, a and l j. So it's a linear combination of two consecutive forms. Here we deduce that following the same reason that Guillermo exposed before, that this form has eta and j sign changes in the, inter in, the, in the interior of the interval delta j, and at most has eta and j plus one zeros outside delta j1. So with this, again, we can conclude that all the zeros of this new form are all real, and simple. And this will be very helpful. Now, if we fix one real number y and suppose that two consecutive form has a common zero, has y as a common zero, necessarily, if we construct this new form, d and j, but when alpha is equal to one and beta is minus this portion here, necessarily, y will become a double zero of this form. But as we before, all zeros are simple, so this is impossible. And with this, we conclude that two linear forms has no consecutive zeros. If we take y then outside the interval delta j plus one, now we construct a new linear form. We have now alpha is equal to a and lj at y and beta is minus a, a and j at y. And let's see that when we evaluate this form at y exactly, this form is zero. And as y then is a simple zero, its derivative must be different from zero. And this will be the final step to conclude that the two linear forms they have interlacing zeros. If we have two consecutive zeros of A and LJ, notice that first, the derivative of A and LJ at Y1 must be different from zero and the same works for Y2. And of course, as two consecutive form has no common zeros, necessarily A and, y, A and J I, N, A has, is, are different from zero at y1 and y2. But what this implies for the linear form d and j, d and j y, sorry. Well, if we differentiate with respect to x and then evaluate at y1, we obtain this expression here that, that must be different from zero and the same works for y2 are also different from zero. But from the previous result, we have that this linear form d n y y y now as a function of one variable y has to be the same sign in the interval y1 y2. But as this form, the linear the derivative of the form a n l j must change its sign in y1 y2 because it has two simple zeros. Therefore, A and J must also change the sign. The, the idea of this proof is borrowed from a previous work uh, with, from Guillermo, Sasha, and Ignacio Rocha. And uh, it was simply adapted to this new, uh, this new situation. 
Now it's necessary to describe the Riemann surface and the conformal map that will give us the asymptotic behavior of the ratio of the two polynomials. In this case, as we have three intervals, we will have a compact Riemann surface with four sheets. The first one, we introduce a cut in the first interval. And in the next sheets, we have two cuts, one in each interval, and in the final sheet, only one cut in the last interval. The, here we view these three sheets by the uh, in the usual way and fix fixed L in between one and three. We define this function CL, which is a conformal map from the Riemann surface to the Riemann sphere with the following conditions. We have one zero, one simple zero at the infinity of the first sheet. And after that, we have a simple pole in, at infinity of the Lth sheet. Notice that this is necessary because the quotients a n l a n j over a n l j has a pole sorry this in the reverse sense has a pole in the elf component as given this divisor this conformal map is unique up to a constant we consider a new normalization given that the multiplication of the of the all the sheets is constant and is can be proved that the yeah. absolute value of c is plus or minus one and the final ingredients to a proof is this lemma, this boundary values problem that has unique solution that gives us zero type functions. And with this boundary value problem and some technical tools, we are able to prove the push, the ratio asymptotic of the polynomials QN that has the following structure. To the limit of two consecutive polynomials is equal to the function f k l given in the previous lemma divided by a constant and this constant depends on uh, the where we are we introduce the index l so which index we add one value in the previous to the l components we have that the constant k CK is the function FKL at infinity. And when we have L in the, we are in the components from L to N, then we have the derivative instead. The convergence is uniformly on each compact subset outside of delta K, the complex plane. So with this, we are ready to prove the find the main result. Given this quotient here, a n l k over a n k, then we rewrite this quotient in the following way. We introduce a n l m and a n m. So now we know the limits of this fraction here and the limit of this fraction here from the results that Guillermo gave us. The limit of this expression is and the Cauchy transform of SKM, okay, and this is the reciprocal. So this the limit of this quotient simplified and is one, and we finally only have the limit of this quotient here. That is are the last polynomials. So A and L M and A and M coincide with the polynomials Q, and we already know the limits of this quotient which is FML over CM. And using then the lemma on the boundary values problems for M, we know that then the limit, this fraction here is exactly the last sheet, the last uh, branch of the conformal map we gave before. So with this, we already have the ratio, the ratio, the limit, the ratio symptotic of these two consecutive polynomials. So here, there are a set of references that were interesting to our job. 
first the work I cited before of Sasha Guillermo Nacho, and in the proof of the ratio asymptotic of the multi orthogonal polynomials, there was important this work here on the ratio of relative asymptotic of polynomials. And of course, there are a set of works related with multi level permitted by the approximants. That's it. I think I go, I went a little fast, a little bit fast. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Okay, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Online audience. Uh, I actually have a question, Luis. Um, can you generalize this construction in the following way? So in the Nikitian system, you each time just have the ratio of two consecutive measures is a Cauchy transform, right? Right. Okay, so what if you allow, you take this Cauchy transform and multiply by a fixed polynomial uh, with zeros conveniently located like outside of the support, can you still prove similar results? Mm. Well, now you said that in some moments, Sergio uh, proposed this kind of transformation of the to the Nikitian system. And we will we were working on that. And I think that Seth is still working on that, but in, we are stuck in some parts of the proof to obtain the convergence and how uh, the polynomials, the perturbed polynomials behave with respect to the previous one. Okay. I don't know if that what it's not the most. Okay. I think you answered my question. Any any other remark, question? Nobody online? Well, thank you very much, Luis, for your presentation. We thank you. Okay, that's great.